session, as I mentioned, Evelyn Forget and Harvey Stevens. I'll just very briefly introduce both of them. Um, Evelyn is an economist and a professor in the Department of Community Health Sciences here at the University of Manitoba and academic director of the Manitoba Research Data Center. Um, she's an adjunct scientist uh, in the Manitoba Center for Health Policy and research associate with Manitoba First Nations uh, uh, Aboriginal Health Research. Of course, many in the basic income uh, uh, crowd are, are really familiar with the interesting research she's done on the Mincom experiment in Dauphin, which she'll be talking about today, so we're really pleased to have Evelyn with us. And the second uh, presenter in this session is Harvey Stevens. Uh, Harvey is a professional associate in the Department of Economics and the Faculty of Arts here at the University of Manitoba. Harvey, uh, as well as his uh, policy and academic interests, actually has personal experience. He, he worked in the, in, in, as a sociologist in the, the Mincom experiment in, in Dauphin, or I guess in both sites, really, Winnipeg and, Winnipeg and Dauphin uh, between 1973 and 76, so he's got that, that, that direct first-hand experience. And he's done interesting work for the Basic Income Canada Network, among others, on modeling what a real basic income might look like. And he's many years' experience as a senior policy analyst in the, uh, with the provincial government here in Manitoba. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Evelyn, who will talk. We'll, have, we'll take a, a few minutes for questions after Evelyn's presentation, but then we'll move on to Harvey's and give them equal time to present their, their material. And, and some questions for Harvey at the end, and maybe if we have a bit of time, uh, kind of open it up for questions around both presentations. So. Uh, please uh, welcome Evelyn Forget. Thanks, Jim. It's always nice to follow Jurgen at these events. Um, I'm an economist, and they call us the dismal science. <laughs> I know a lot of you have heard my story about Dauphin, and I thank you for your patience because it's very much the same story I'm going to tell again. I think I'm approaching guaranteed income from the perspective of an investment, a social investment, an investment in which not only the recipients benefit personally, but society as a whole benefits. I'm an economist, but I'm a health economist, and I'm actually based at Manatine. And you don't have to walk through the halls of the Health Sciences Center or sit in the waiting room of clinic or go to any of these places without recognizing that it's very, very difficult to distinguish between poverty and poor health and that the system we currently have, the status quo, is paying a lot of money to treat the consequences of poverty. That's just in health, and you can imagine all of the other social programs for which this is the case. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the evidence we do have, recognizing that there's a lot of other evidence out there that we don't have. I'm talking about MINCOM. MINCOM was the Canadian negative income tax experiment that ran between 1974 and 1979. The money flowed between 1974 and 1978, and this was a cost-shared program between the province of Manitoba and the federal government. Federal government covered 75% of the costs and the province covered 25% of the costs. And this occurred at a time when Canada and North America in general were rethinking a whole lot of different social programs that were being offered. Um, the program itself was set up as a refundable tax credit, what at the time was called the negative income tax. And I'm speaking specifically about the Dauphin site. I'll talk a little bit about the entire experiment in a minute. Um, in the Dauphin site, someone with no income from any other source would receive about 60% of the low income cutoff. And that's about the same amount that they would have received from what at the time was called mother's allowance if they qualified. For every additional dollar they received from other sources, including labor income, their benefits would be reduced, but they would be reduced less than proportionately. And what that means is that people with incomes well above 60% of the LICO would still receive, be receiving at least partial benefits. So the working poor benefited as well as those people outside the labor market. Now, I talk a lot about Dauphin, but it's important to remember that there were actually two experimental sites. And the Winnipeg sample, in some ways, was the most important site in this experiment at the time. But I'm focusing on Dauphin because there was something unique about Dauphin. It was a saturation site. And that means that everybody who lived in town received the same promise. That is, if they wanted to, it was entirely voluntary. 
If they wanted to, and if their income was low enough to qualify, they could take their pay slips to the income office and receive payments under the scheme. So in a sense, it was like a general rollout of what the program would be if we introduced it. In Winnipeg, it was only a subsample of the population that um, participated in the experiment. Um, the purpose of MINCOM and all of the other guaranteed annual income experiments in North America was basically to find out what the effect would be on the labor market. And Wayne Simpson's going to come this afternoon and tell you a little bit about what happened, but I'm going to steal his thunder um, and tell you what they found. Um, basically, they found that there was very little reaction. Um, people, grown-up people who had full-time jobs didn't quit their jobs in droves. They didn't reduce the number of hours. They worked dramatically. There was a very small reaction. But there were two groups of people who did reduce the number of hours they worked. And they reduced them in really interesting ways. Married women, secondary earners, tended to use the guaranteed income to buy themselves longer maternity leaves. When they left the labor market to give birth, they stayed out longer than they otherwise would have. And if you remember back, remember your history in some cases, back to the 1970s, maternity leave during that period was like four weeks or six weeks. So it was substantially shorter than it is today. And the other finding is really the basis of um, my research and what I'm gonna talk about today. Young unattached males, and here the language is really, really important. Young unattached males tended to reduce their labor market participation by up to 80%. There was a huge fall off. And if you use that language, you get this picture in your mind of young men running away from all their responsibilities, quitting in order to serve for skateboard or whatever people did in Dauphin in the 1970s. Um, if you use a slightly different language, you might be a little bit closer to the truth. And that is that adolescent children um, reduce the number of hours they work significantly. And they reduced them because they took their first full-time job at a later age. Now that's kind of interesting. If they weren't working, what were they doing instead? Um, that's where I started. Um, I'm, it, the research funding for this experiment began to run out midway through the experiment. The families continued to be paid, but a lot of the peripheral research projects w um, were cut and there was a greater focus on the labor market. The data was collected, but during the experiment itself, there was no significant analysis of the social issues that I'm going to talk about today, and virtually no analysis of the Dauphin sample. So several years ago, when I tried to find a trace of this experiment and find out what happened, I discovered 1,800 boxes of data. Um, these are paper copies, right, sitting in the National Archives. Paper copies of administrative records, questionnaires, there were reports of embedded anthropologists and sociologists who lived in Dauphin. Um, there were interviews with subjects on all kinds of things. Um, but I faced two limitations. First, a lot of this stuff was in paper format, so the data was not usable for the kind of statistical analysis I wanted to do. And secondly, the Research Ethics Board put some limitations on my ability to contact participants in the experiment. I wasn't supposed to invade the privacy of people. So I wondered whether there might be another way to get at the impact in Dauphin. Now this is just a reminder, the money flowed from 1974 to 1978, and I started with that suspicion that I might be able to find all those unattached young males who were evading their labor market responsibilities. And the first thing I did was to call the Department of Education and get enrollment statistics um, for all Manitoba high schools throughout the 1970s, and I made up this statistic which is essentially grade 12 enrollment as a percent of the previous year's grade 11 enrollment. What does that mean? Well, it means that if there's no change in the underlying population, and there wasn't for Dauphin, um, and everybody in grade 11 continues on to grade 12, those bars will reach 100%. The bigger your dropout rate between grade 11 and grade 12, the more those bars fall below 100%. So the light blue there represents Dauphin. The far left bar. The purple in the middle is Winnipeg, and the white is the rest of Manitoba. And until 1974, there are no real surprises there. Not much difference between Dauphin and the rest of Manitoba. City kids are more likely to continue to grade 12 than kids who live outside the city, about what you'd expect. Look what happens in 1975. People in Dauphin start receiving money under MINCOM, 
and kids in Dauphin start continuing to grade 12. In fact, they're more likely to continue to grade 12 than the Winnipeg kids. 1976, it goes above 100%. Kids who were out there working, who'd quit school, were coming back to school to finish grade 12. 1977, 1978, it's continuing at almost 100%. Money stops, and we go right back to where we started from. Ignore that last set of bars. My data gets a bit wonky because they built a couple of high schools and messed things up for me in <laughs> suburban Manitoba. So I wondered whether I might be able to find traces of income in other data. And I looked at the health data. This is the health administration data that's collected by Manitoba Health when you have any interaction with the healthcare system. So if you've lived in Manitoba, this is all I need to tell you, this is all de-identified data. I have no identifying information here. This is all carefully regulated confidential data. But if you've lived in Manitoba at any time between 1971 and the present, you're in the population registry identified by a nine-digit personal identifier and a six-digit family number. And that means I can create medical histories for you. I can link you to your family members. I have your six-digit postal code of residence every six months, so I can follow you around the province. And because I, can, I have the six-digit postal code, I can link to the long-form census that we used to have and find out a lot about you and your neighborhood. Um, a lot of things have happened since 1974. And I wanted to make sure that anything that I found was actually due to income and not due to something else. So I created a control group. And the first thing I did was to hard match on geography. So my Dauphin folks are subjects. What I wanted to do was to find a lot of other people like my Dauphin people. And so I started with my database and I took out everybody living in Winnipeg because people who live in the city have different access to health care than people who live outside the city. I took out people who live in the north because there are some access issues with healthcare in the north, so it's a little bit different. I took out everybody living on reserves, because if you live on a reserve, your health care is the responsibility of the federal government, so you don't show up in my provincial database the same way. And what I had left were a whole lot of people living in places pretty much like Dauphin. And then I matched on other characteristics. I matched on a whole series of individual, family, and community characteristics, and I found three matches for every Dauphin resident. So if I have a 25-year-old woman in Dauphin, I found three other 25-year-old women who lived in similar kinds of families and similar kinds of places, and I compared their health care usage. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I, well, let me skip that, because I'm going to run out of time. So what happened? Um, the first thing I did was to look at hospitalization rates. And the blue line there represents Dauphin, and the red line represents the controls. And you can see before income, people in Dauphin were about 8.5% more likely to be hospitalized than people in the control group. When the money started to flow, those two lines start to come together. By the end of the income period, there's no significant difference between Dauphin and the control group. What does that mean? means hospitalization rates fell by 8.5% over the course of the experiment for the people who received the promise of funding under income. Now that tends to be a statistical result. What does it mean? What does it actually mean? Well, at the time, Canada was spending about $10 billion a year on hospitals. Right now, Canada is spending well over $50 billion a year on hospitals. If hospitalization rates fall by 8.5%, we're talking over $4 billion of potential savings in hospital costs alone. I also looked specifically, I tried to drill down into the data and to find out what was causing the reduction in hospitalization. And I found two categories. The first were accidents and injuries. Accidents and injuries capture almost all acute hospitalizations. So they're capturing results of things like car accidents, bar fights, family violence, almost everything you can imagine. And so, <coughs> excuse me. And so one of the questions I might ask is, if I'm not receiving any money from income, how do I benefit? Well, I benefit, I benefit if I'm not, um, if, if, if I don't face so many drunk drivers on the road. I benefit if there's less violence in my community. The other big category, and probably a bigger category, are mental health diagnoses. People were much less likely to be hospitalized with mental health diagnoses. 
after um, income was introduced. And again, you can imagine how the promise of a guaranteed income reduces the stress that families live with. I looked at people's contacts with family doctors and I found exactly the same pattern. Were there other effects? Well, I looked for three other things. Um, if you reduce poverty, one of the things that uh, researchers expect to find is an improvement in birth outcomes. Fewer low birth weight babies, for example. And that's important because low birth weight babies tend to have a lot of health issues that follow them throughout childhood and even into adulthood. I also looked at birth rates because there was a political concern at the time. Um, the female counterparts of all those young men who were running away from their job opportunities, there was a political fear that their female counterparts would stay home and have more babies in order to increase their entitlement under the benefit scheme. So I looked to see if there was a baby boom in Dauphin. And I looked at divorce rates, and again, this was politically motivated. Um, many of the US experiments, um, there was a, co a political concern that a basic income or a guaranteed income um, w would attack the American family, that it would encourage women to um, go it alone and um, would reduce uh, the cohesion of a family that seemed to be bound by financial need. So I looked at those three things and I found no effect on birth outcomes. Um, this is a picture of the uh, Ukrainian Catholic Church in Dauphin, and it's just a reminder that birth and divorce rates are affected by a lot of things other than guaranteed annual income. But you'll be happy to know that there was no baby boom in Dauphin during the experiment. In fact, Dauphin, like everywhere else in North America, was facing a, a very rapidly declining um, birth rate during the period. And no matter how I measured it, um, birth rates seemed to fall further and faster in Dauphin than among the controls. And I looked at the divorce rates, and uh, guaranteed income might have been an attack on the American family, but you'll be happy to know that the Canadian family managed to survive it um, without great effect. Um, I think children may have been the most affected by this experiment. They tended to stay in high school longer. This is an, a part of the social investment we're talking about. How do I benefit if my neighbor's child stays in school longer? Well, in a couple of ways. First of all, I'm living in a country with more intellectual capital that's gonna grow faster. There's economic benefits to that. Um, there are social benefits to having more high school graduates. I also benefit because my own child, who's a friend of my neighbor's child, is a little bit more likely to stay in school if, um, if his friends do. Um, people tend to have their first child at an older age, and that's associated with all kinds of good things. Um, you know, better, better health for the child and for the parent, better financial outcomes, better educational outcomes. And people had fewer children over a lifetime. And again, that's associated with beneficial social and educational and economic outcomes. Um, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to set aside. Um, I have here the results of a number of experiments that Lindor Reynolds, or a number of interviews that Lindor Reynolds conducted with participants in the Dauphin experiment, but I'm just gonna end with um, one guy. Rick Zaplitny was talking about the income experiment and he actually lived in Dauphin during the period and his income was too high to qualify. And he's the sort of person you'd expect who would be um, not supportive of income because effectively his tax dollars are going to support a program that other people would benefit from. He was a chartered accountant there wasn't very much likelihood that he would ever benefit. And so what did he have to say? He said, we always felt the problem with the welfare system, it was, it was punitive. If you made money, they took it away from you. It seemed to us that income was for people who were on that line. They weren't deadbeats, they just needed a bit of a boost. I'd be in favor of it now. Helping someone have a decent living wage is hard to argue with. Thank you. Um, people want a simple answer to that question all the time, and I always waffle a little bit, and I'm going to go back to Jurgen. The devil's in the details, right? Would the hospital savings, would the health care costs alone pay for a basic income? The, the answer is yes, of some sort, but probably not the sort of basic income that anybody would, uh, would want. 
Um, when people talk about a guaranteed annual income, they're usually talking about some kind of a living wage tied in some way to the LICO, something like $20,000 a year, you know, in that range. For 8.5% um, of $50 billion comes out to $4 billion. That's not enough to pay for that. Um, on the other hand, this is one social program. And if you think about a lot of other social programs that are affected by poverty, I talk about health because I have health data and I work in the health field. But if you think about special education and the costs of poverty showing up in special education, if you think about um, things like youth justice and the consequences of poverty and the costs of poverty showing up in the youth justice system, we pay a lot for the status quo. Poverty costs us a lot of money. Doing nothing costs us a lot of money right now. <coughs> Would it pay for itself? I don't know. I don't, I don't want to steal Harvey's thunder. He's going to talk a little bit about the costs of different kinds of programs. But there are a lot of things that you ought to keep in mind. Every 1% increase or reduction in the GST costs $7 billion. If we go back to what the GST was in 2006, we have an extra $14 billion to work with. Um, $2.9 billion is the price they put on income splitting. They're talking about $12 billion for an enhancement to the child tax credit. Our programs cost a lot of money. We can put together a pretty substantial top-up program over and above the existing programs that would move people towards the LICO for some, well, I don't want to throw out money, but I mean, I don't want to throw out dollar figures across Canada because it really does depend on how you design it. But it's not an, un, it's not an inconceivable um, cost that we're talking about. But probably, yes, it would cost more than the savings that we'll get out of healthcare. It won't pay for itself. I wish I could. I don't have any data for that, um, for that at all. Um, we do know that mothers were staying home longer with infants, which tend to be associated with better outcomes um, for children and for families. We know that poverty um, tends to be related with very poor outcomes at, at preschool and elementary school age. So to the extent that MNCOM is, is, um, is doing something about the poverty rate, is ameliorating poverty, the outcome should be very good for young children, and I, my guess is that they would be much stronger for young children than for older children, but I just simply didn't have the data to look at it. Sorry. Yeah. Um, Criminal justice statistics in rural Manitoba, in rural areas in general, tend to be very wonky. Um, the numbers are small, and so they're kind of all over the place, and um, a lot of you know, a lot of things don't get reported, or they get reported in odd kinds of ways. It, it, there's not a huge murder rate in a place like Dauphin, so you know, it, it, the numbers just don't make sense in a small town. Um, it does make sense to look in large cities, and um, some of the negative income tax experiments in the U.S. looked at, um, at criminal, um, at, at crime rates um, and um, interaction with, with the justice system and did find a reduction, but not for this project. Okay, maybe uh, uh, I want to get, uh, we want to make sure Harvey has a sufficient time as well. So, uh, once again, thanks, Evelyn, um, for really simulating. <laughs> <laughs>